Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of Deep Light by Francis Hardinge. So, uh, this is published by Pan, so I guess it is, uh, well yeah, it is kind of fantasy. I don't know what else you'd call it actually, so yes, it's a fantasy novel. Uh, it's hard to describe what's happening, so I'm just going to read you the blur, I'm going to go through and check on my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end, so... Dane reads... On the island of Ladies Crave live Hark and his best friend Jell. They are scavengers, living off their wits, diving for relics of the gods, desperate for anything they can sell. But now there is something restless stirring beneath the waves, calling to someone brave enough to retrieve it. Something valuable, something dangerous. An electrifying story about a friendship as dark and dangerous as the ocean, and a journey as treacherous as the gods themselves. And yes, the gods are very treacherous in this. Um, so I'm going to uh, read you here this disclaimer because it's fantastic. The laws of physics were harmed during the making of this book. In fact, I tortured them into horrific new shapes while cackling. So right at the beginning, um, Hark is, he's, he's kind of conning rich people basically. Well, he, he's, it's like very Dickensian, he's um, like a young urchin telling tales to a rich man in the hope of coin, you know. Stories were currency and Hark understood that better than most. What did a few exaggerations matter? The merchant will be dining out on these tales for years once he got home to the western continent. And uh, he gets, his friend Jelk kind of gets him to take part in this, this these hijinks um, for a family of smugglers. Um, and he gets caught and uh, he goes, he, uh, he had to keep his brain sharp, despair was a numbing poison, the moment you decided the worst was inevitable, it was. Uh, a casually thrown stone hit him in the ear, he flinched but didn't look around, no point in letting the next hit him straight in the eye socket, he swore but didn't take it personally. He had thrown stones at captured criminals now and then, not through malice but just because he could. It had never really occurred to him not to, just because someday the person in chains might be him. In fact he had always known deep down that someday it would be him and that stones would be thrown at him. So it seemed natural to make the most of it while he could be the thrower instead of the thrown at. Uh, and we, we learn as well, uh, he's not going to have a trial. On Ladies Crave, a criminal case is handed to one of the governor's justices who listen to the guards and decide on the spot whether they've been right to arrest you. You only get a trial if the justice thinks the guards have messed up or if a powerful person is willing to vouch for you. And no powerful person is willing to vouch for him, but somebody does sort of essentially buy him as a slave, uh, Dr. Doctor Vine, and she's going to teach him to read... Um, and he thinks, reading makes your brain soft, Jelt had always said. You live in the world or you live in a book, you can't do both. And what's in those books anyway? Just a load of rot written by fat saps who never learned anything the hard way. What's the point of them? In Jelt's mind, illiteracy was a badge of honour. Whenever Hark remembered that, his excitement felt disloyal. But he was excited. None of his friends on Ladies Crave could read. Reading made you useful and respectable. Reading made you look smart. He gave you toeholds in your upward climb. And Hark had always known it. And then uh, Jout comes and finds him while he's sort of in exile, um, serving the person who bought him. And Jout has another plan. And Hark thinks he still had the power to rat out Jelt, but even hinting such a thing felt impossible and unforgivable. Perhaps that was the difference between the strong and the weak. Those who dared make threats and follow them through and those who didn't. And Hark's trying to decide whether to tell Dr. Vine. If Hark wanted to tell her, it had to be now. Telling the truth was dangerous though. You could never untell it any more than you could unbreak an egg. It was better to let things be. And Dr. Vine says to him, you like stories, don't you? Everyone says that the gods used to breathe fear, but I think you breathe stories. Unless you're telling them or hearing them, you wither up and die. So I'll tell you a story. The story of the glass cardinal, his dome rippled like silk, shot with a thousand colours. They say he had a scream so beautiful it broke people's minds. Though that doesn't make much sense if you think about it. Who was unbroken enough to report it? Great quote here, loyalty is not a virtue in its own right. Its worth depends on where it is spent. And uh, there's an old, old man called Quest. Basically Hark is working like taking care of the old um, priests and monks. Um, from back in the day that the gods were active. So one of them is called Quest and he says, at my age there are a few greater fears than discovering that one has become dull. Let's get the little line, people aren't fair when they're angry, which is very true. So Dr. Vine creates uh, her own submarine essentially. She says, I call her the screaming sea butterfly. She's a prototype. What does that mean? Asked Hark. It means that every voyage is a safety test and it will be scientifically fascinating if we die in her. Vine answered cheerfully. I like that definition. And Hark realises he's he's losing some of his friends, you know. He says uh, he felt a weight in the pit of his stomach. You wore people out like shoes. You didn't mean to, but you did. This is what it felt like when the soul started getting thin. Uh, Vine has a grey moleskin notebook. But isn't moleskin a brand? 
it just seems weird it's like saying that you know they're in this they're in this uh fantasy world and she's using like a parker pen or a biro or something for a gillette razor and quest is thinking about when he joined the priesthood um he says in order to do what we did in those days, we needed to believe in our own holiness. However, if you believe that you are holier than other people, then I think after a while you lose something. Humility, warmth, humour. Many of us agonised over the sacrifices at first, but habit deadens you. The scars build up on your soul. And uh, he joined because of a woman, basically. And Quest says, We are all squeezed into new shapes by the people around us. If we are paying attention, though, we always have some say in how we are altered. And Quest uh, he says, Change is a lot more frightening when you're older. Uh, he did not look afraid. If anything, he seemed slightly wistful. Gradually, gradually, your body lets you down. You reach a certain age, and almost every change is bad news. Bulletins from the front in a war you're losing. At your age, you're still asking yourself, who should I be? I must ask myself, did I manage to be the person I wanted to be in the end? And how many chances do I have left to be that person? <laughs> and we get this little bit, which I just think is there's a funny line here that made me chuckle, but also, you know, it kind of relates to the gods that we have in our world. Um, why does she always try to stab me? You're just the nearest unbeliever, said Hart. I'm not an unbeliever, snapped Cly. He was reddening now with embarrassment and annoyance. Just because I don't worship your rotting, murderous fish monsters, what's the point of a god you can pickle? What's the point of a god that you can't see that doesn't do anything? Hark flashed back, unable to stop himself. You can see the sun, you can watch the seasons. A great line here. It was like finding yourself surrounded by starving people and suddenly realizing that you were made of bread. And we learn basically the gods live in the water and they feed on fear. And um, Quest says, all human fear runs down into the undersea just as streams and rivers run into the sea. Human fear has a terrible power. It changes everything, distorts everything, maddens everything. Fear is the dark womb where monsters are born and thrive. And we learn a bit more about the truth behind the gods. And um, again, this comes in the form of Hark talking to Quest. Uh, Why are you talking like this? He said accusingly. You were a priest. You served the gods. Yes, I did. That is how I know what horrors they really were. Quest leaned forward. What do you think the gods were, Hark, in your heart of hearts? Do you secretly think that they were majestic, terrible but just, in their own inscrutable way? Perhaps all their actions would make sense if our minds could only rise to a high enough state of being. Um, Hark was shaking his head. No, no, that was the old crazy way of thinking. He couldn't think like that. Only old people thought like that. Nonetheless, he could feel his neck flushing. Of course you do, said the old man, and he shook his head bitterly. Everybody does, deep down. That is our fault, the fault of the priests. It is a fantasy we sold to the people of the myriad so that everyone's oppression would be more bearable. We let everyone tell themselves that they were watched over by gods rather than terrorised by monsters. And we reassured everyone that the priesthood had everything under control. We had treaties with the gods and knew how to negotiate with them. All of that was a lie. The gods had no great or benevolent plan for us. There were no treaties. We never truly learned to reason with them because they were not reasonable. Even those whom we could talk with were all mad to some degree. And the biggest gods, the mightiest among them, had no more power of reason than beasts. Basically, the bigger and more powerful the gods got, like the less of a mind they had. And Quest, um... He has this final little monologue. I did gamble with countless lives. For 30 years I've been wrestling with this and trying to decide whether I did the right thing. I've even tried to guess how many more would have been killed by the gods or murdered as sacrifices over the last three decades if I had not done what I did. But that is self-deception. You cannot justify an atrocity with mathematics. Is a terrible deed ever worth it for the greater good? I'm sure those leaguers thought so when they were building that god. Am I any better than them? I cannot say. All I know is that I could not bear to do nothing about the gods, and I could not think of anything else to do. And one final quote here. Rumour is like sand. Once it is blowing about, it is very hard to keep it out of anywhere. So yeah, Deep Light by Francis Hardinge. I was very impressed by this. I've enjoyed all of the Hardinge I've read anyway, so uh, I shouldn't be too surprised. But yeah, it was fantastically written. Um, I love the lore. What's interesting is that even though it's a standalone, it felt as though it was an instalment in a series just because of you know, how deep the lore in it is and um, how kind of quickly you get on board with, with what's uh, what's written here. So I gave Deep Light by Francis Harding, probably a 4.5 out of 5, a uh, very solid book. A little bit slow for the first 30, 40 pages while you're kind of really getting into it, but then it takes off like a rocket ship. So there we have it, Deep. that's what I made of Deep Light by Francis Hardinge. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.